thanks, everybody. It's great to be back. Yeah, as Chuck said, uh, last time I was here, um, I was the JavaScript guy who knew, knew nothing about finance. Uh, this time, I'm the kind of finance guy who's not going to talk about JavaScript. So I hope you'll, <laughs> I hope that'll be okay. I'm going to talk about architecture in general for financial systems and um, some of the lessons we've learned by working on front end, especially in JavaScript, because JavaScript is so expressive and has moved so quickly. Um, so as Chuck said, uh, for eight years, I worked at Facebook. And for most of that time, I was responsible for a group that went by a bunch of different names, but we called it product infrastructure. And it was all about how to build products faster and build better products faster. And uh, this group produced a ton of technology. Some of it's internal only to Facebook. A bunch of it's been open sourced. Um, React, React Native, GraphQL are some of the best known ones. Um, and uh, I don't want to talk about React today. Instead, I want to talk about the architecture that goes with it. Um, when we first open source React and started talking about it, we started also talking about this architecture we called the Flux architecture. Have people seen this diagram before? OK, a lot of people have. That's great. I was hoping so. Um, and uh, the idea here is, is pretty simple. What we said is that instead of a conventional MVC architecture where you have these model objects that are both loaded from the server and updated by the client, we want to try to straighten out the way that data flows through our application. And we call that flux, very simple. And we did it by introducing this idea of a dispatcher, an event uh, emitter that kind of sits at the middle of this architecture and is this kind of narrow gate through which every change in the system has to pass through. Now, this was not a new idea. Uh, but we didn't really connect it to the old ideas in computer science. Um, the, uh, the thing that had been around for a really long time was this idea called CQRS, uh, which stands for, and this is a mouthful, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And you can tell this is a really old idea because we don't use any of these terms anymore, really. Uh, command, we would just call that a write. And query, we would just call that a read. Um, but uh, this idea had been around for a long time, and it wasn't really in use. And in the same way that when we introduced React, people looked at us like we were crazy because we were putting what effectively looked like templates in the middle of our JavaScript program, um, CQRS you know, didn't, ha doesn't, didn't and still doesn't in many ways have the best reputation in systems design. And that's what I want to talk about today. But I just want to point out real quick that Flux is CQRS. It's that simple, right? So, uh, the command is really easy to see. These are these actions. And part of what makes Flux so powerful is that we materialize these actions and we can apply constraints to them. Like we can make them well typed. We can limit their introduction into a certain file. We can enumerate them. There are a bunch of different ways that we can constrain what these commands are. Uh, the query is a little harder to see here. There's like a missing arrow kind of. The view makes the query and then the store pushes at that data. And because the views usually subscribe and not just query, that's why we show the arrow kind of going the other way. But it's still there. But as I said, you know, when we introduced Flux, we didn't really talk about CQRS. And, and that's in part because like, we didn't want to drag it down with the baggage that was attached to it. Um, I pulled this quote off of Martin Fowler's um, resource, uh, Blicky. I don't know quite how to say it. Uh, you know, and he's still, that, there's still this text there that warns people away from CQRS. It, it says that uh, you can use it, but use it with caution and use it only in a small part of your system. And um, that's what I want to reevaluate. And the reason why is because what we saw with Flux is that, um, you know, when, when we introduced Flux, we just did it as a talk and, uh, uh, and as a blog post. We didn't release any code with it. And we were kind of surprised at, like, of course, 11 different implementations of Flux sprang up, and people argued about like, whether you should type your actions or whatever. Um, but I think that this you know, Flux kind of went in a direction that was ultimately embodied by this project called Redux. And uh, I assume there are some people who use Redux in the room here. OK, yeah, I see some hands. That's great. I'm glad to see it. You know, Redux, MobX, Elm, it doesn't matter which one of these things you use they all kind of take this Flux architecture and take it to the next level. And the idea behind Redux, if you hadn't, haven't really seen it, is to embrace uh, what we would call an event sourcing pattern. And the idea behind event sourcing is that all of the state in your application should just be all the things that have ever happened in your application. That's the way you should think of it. So uh, the cool thing about event sourcing is that when you need to write a new state, 
you always append it to the end. You never change anything. You just introduce a new action, and you write it at the end. That's really easy. Hard to screw that up. The hard part is when you want to read it. Uh, theoretically, we want to go through every action that's ever happened and figure out what state we're in. In reality, of course, that would be too slow, and it just sounds like a really bad idea. Uh, so we know we need to introduce a cache where we're going to read from. The cool thing about Redux, and again, and its ilk, is that we can do this in a very functional way because this event source list is immutable. So we introduce a function that reads every action that's ever happened in order and then writes it to a cache. And because we never change anything, we can always just update our cache by reading the most recent thing that, hap that happened and join that with the state that we just had. And if you've used Redux, you know that's exactly how that works. Now, I'm going to put this down for a second. This is kind of where, where we've been and talk a little bit about uh, where I am now, which is at Robinhood. So in June, I left Facebook, and I took a role at Robinhood as, as the VP of engineering. And uh, very exciting for me and uh, really fun. You know, I, I really loved working on front end. I loved working at Facebook. But it was exciting for me to start looking at like all of engineering and how all of these systems fit together. And it was also really exciting for me to learn more about finance because this is something that I didn't know that much about. Um, and of course, as soon as I took this role, I reached out to Mitra and was like, yeah, I want to come back now. I actually have some reason to be there. Um, and I want to tell you a tiny bit about what I've learned about working in finance in just three months. And it, you know, it's, it's pretty fresh. Um, but I want to tie that architectural pattern I was just telling you about to the way we build new products in finance. Um, and what I've learned is that finance boils down to pretty much one thing in implementation. And that's accounting. And um, accounting is, is pretty cool. And you know it's very engineery. Um, so I totally vibe with it. Um, and what I learned about accounting is that uh, no accountant really cares what the value is, you know, like what the balance is or what one number is. The whole point about accounting is to create a system uh, and a record that leads you back to that number so that you can verify it, you can double check it against something, you can do double entry and make sure things zero out. Does that remind you of anything that we were just talking about? It's exactly like this event sourcing pattern. Now, here's the thing. Um, Robinhood, to this day, like probably most of you, relies on relational databases for implementing most of its logic. So when we, for instance, take an order and we write, you know, we need to remember, like, we can't just go debit your account and be like, yeah, okay, now you have $168, uh, get on with it. We have to write down, okay, this is how we ended up taking $32 out of your account. Um, so we have this ledger of everything that's ever happened. The problem is that when we go to read, we don't want to have to read the whole ledger just to know what your balance is. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce another table in the same database which keeps your balances. And because this is a relational database, we have to wrap this all in a transaction. Um, so sure, we can read from this table and we get the information that we want. But what it means is that whenever we add to the ledger, we have to remember to update the balances. And that's OK. You know, we all use database transactions all the time. They, they totally work. Um, what, the problem uh, that we see at Robinhood, I think a lot of these distributed systems see, is that um, pressure accumulates on this database. Like, it's hard to get things not to all collapse into the black hole of the one transaction that does everything. And it's especially hard because on the read side, every single service that wants to know your balance is going to come hammer this database. And this is the one where we're taking our most critical writes. And not only that, but every service wants to look at the information in the balance table a little differently. So we introduce a bajillion indexes on that table, which in turn continue to slow down our database performance. Um, and all of this is worst at peak times when we're both trying to read and write at the same time. And again, at Robinhood, we see this, you know, and, and we're, we're sort of, especially like there's one crunch time that we all know about when the market opens uh, where we see like really heavy load and we're kind of always trying to pull things out of this database and, and be more efficient that way. Um, and I went through the... I went through the little exercise of like, you know, this leads us down this path of like having this one transaction that everything sits inside. And I kind of wanted to demonstrate where this ends up just in like kind of a theoretical way. So I busted out some UML. Um, and uh, 
The interesting thing when you look at this you know, and really think about what's happening here is you start with like your phone. Robinhood's a, a phone app. If you haven't seen it, it's, a, it's like a brokerage app. You can buy and sell equities and options. Um, so there's a thread on my device that's making a request to the Robinhood server. It says like, hey, I want to buy some shares. Um, that opens a thread on the web server. Uh, or maybe there's one open and I'm going to like join it. There are different ways to do that depending on what web server we're using. That, in turn, is going to make a request to this account service that is tied to this relational database that we were just looking at. And it's going to start a database transaction. We're going to make sure I have the right amount of funds and do some reads and writes, whatever. Now, we don't want this, we don't want, like, this main service that like, wraps our relational database to also be the one that's talking to the execution venues, like service-oriented architecture. We want to break these things up. They have different concerns, different resource constraints. But once we do that, it means that we now have a nested transaction that spans two systems. I started a transaction where I, tr where I go to reserve these funds. Now I need to tell my execution service to enqueue this order. If that fails, and we all know that services fail, I have this really complicated cleanup flow. I have timeout, rollback. I may even have to go back and cancel that order if it ended up in some weird state. So you can see that I've got like literally four different computers that may be like in very different places in the world, all concurrently holding memory and state just to complete this. Uh, and and you know, eventually, if everything works, um, it comes back to the client. And, and if things fail, we want to tell the client anyway. So uh, with just the, the little bit of time we have left, I want to talk about an alternate way. And I want to be clear, this is super hand wavy. This is not how order placement works at Robinhood. I'm sure no system works this way at all. Um, but if this is hand wavy, what I'm about to show you is just totally out there. So um, I want to be clear that no one has built anything that's really like this yet. But I want to illustrate what I think is possible and some of the things that we're working on and working towards at, Robin, at Robinhood. Um, the idea here would be, like, let's unwind some of our dependency on relational databases and relational database transactions, and instead think about this as an event stream, like the one that we saw in Redux. When the user places an order, we drop an event in the stream. And we pick this up in our account service as a message, OK, we should set aside the funds for this, for this order. At the same time, we'll start like a, a watchdog service that's going to keep an eye on this on this kind of transaction. It's no longer a transaction in the, uh, in the relational database sense. Um, but it'll remember that we're trying to do this and maybe have a timer going that will cancel the order if, if it never completes. Um, and one cool thing about event source pattern is that we can have multiple consumers of the same event, basically for free. That's pretty sweet. Uh, so account service responds, happy case, says your order's approved, issues a token for it or something like that. Now the order service picks that up. It sees, OK, user want to place an order, and we've reserved the funds. Let me go talk to the execution venue, try to place this order. Comes back, says, yep, we did it with a token. Watchdog says, OK, I got you. You're set. Um, not talking really now about how that gets back to the client. I'll cover that in a second. Um, failure case is also pretty uh, doable, I think. You know, Let's say the order never comes back. Instead, the watchdog will time out, inject a new event in the stream, and say, OK, everybody, clean up. This isn't going to happen. So you can see what we've done is we've taken state that's inside the database transaction and materialized it. We're just going to treat every single state transition as like a real place that we can be rather than something that's like happening in memory. Um, and if it fails, it has to get rolled back. Uh, I want to be clear. There, there isn't enough yet to build this. We need to build a bunch of things to make this work. I just want to illustrate a couple things that we need here. First one is. Here's something that we're tempted to do and can no longer do. Order service needs to remember something about the uh, state of the account service. So it's like, hey, uh, account service, what about Adam's equity balance? Can't do that, because we've lost sync between these two services. And now, if I ask the account service, it might be in a different state. It means that the order service has to maintain its own cache of the state of the account service. And you know, I don't know, maybe replicating these uh, caches will be good and like distribute the load. Or maybe it'll be really stupid, because we'll have like eight of the same indexes on different systems throughout the world. There are ways we could share this. You could call back with a certain time or something like that and get time sync, but it could be pretty complicated. Another thing that's tricky here is that um, with this idea of a watchdog service that times out the transaction, it makes this order service like, like a real-time service. 
And I don't mean real time like chat. I mean real time like brakes and rocket steering and stuff like that. It means that if the order service doesn't respond by a deadline, it's worse than just failing, you know? And it needs to go clean itself up. Now, there's a lot of prior art here. There are a lot of real time systems in computing that work on hard deadlines. But I don't know about you. I don't know much about how those systems work. So I have a few papers to read there. Um, last thing, and I recognize as a front end conference, I just want to say, you know, we saw a little bit of this from Bavesh in the last talk, but it changes how we think about how the client should interact with our servers. That's the last thing it changes. So when the client calls up, it should, it should get an immediate response like, OK, I, know, I heard you. I'll let you know what happens. And then really everything that we hear from the server should come back asynchronously on a separate uh, event channel. Um, because that's how it's going to, you know, there's gonna, no longer going to be a thread open on the server that corresponds to this computation. Um, so a lot of theory here. What about, you know, like what's really happened? Uh, well, you know, a lot of what I just presented um, is, uh, is, is buildable on top of this open source abstraction called Apache Kafka, and Robinhood uses this really extensively. Kafka's pretty cool. Um, it offers uh, a durable message queue. So once you write to it, we promise we got your message. Even if no one reads it and everything fails, we'll come back up and remember. Um, it imposes a total order on the messages, so we can all agree about when stuff happened. Um, and uh, as of its latest version, it offers exactly once semantics. So we can make sure that a service processes each event once and only once. Um, it's partitionable. It can be, you know, it kind of has a rep of being slow. Um, you know, the funny thing about financial systems I've learned is that a lot of what we do is actually pretty slow. You know, like equity transactions settle in two days. So I think we can like wait an extra second to hear all the events on a, on a channel. Um, last thing, just a quick plug for uh, our nascent open source program at Robinhood. Uh, we have this uh, little open source project called Faust. Um, it's a nice way of writing programs that consume a Kafka queue in Python. It uses Python 3's async await feature so that you can write like highly concurrent uh, iterators over an Apache, uh, over a Kafka event stream. Uh, and if you've used async await in JavaScript, you know how powerful that feature, that linguistic feature can be. Anyway, that's just a little sample of what we're working at at Robinhood. Thanks so much for having me. I look forward to talking to you. Thanks. Thank you.